Hello and welcome everyone to World Vegan Vision Mumbai and its first online conference in 2021. My name is Ruchika Chitrabhanu and I warmly welcome you all today for the series of Awakening Souls. World Vegan Vision is a global non-profit organization based in New York, USA. founded by Harshad Shah and his wife Malti Shah uh, so thank you so much for uh this fantastic um opportunity that we have together to focus on compassion and liberation of animals compassion for animals and for each other for ourselves as uh was just saying uh this human life is an opportunity for us to grow and awaken spiritually and if we fail uh to use it in that way then we will um uh, fail in many ways to contribute to the healing and the awakening of our world that is so needed and will be just part of the problem here and as she was saying there are you know it's a big problem <laughs> many problems so uh when we look to the ancient wisdom traditions uh of all the cultures and i think especially of india we see that uh, there's a profound emphasis placed upon each one of us as an individual taking responsibility for the quality of our own consciousness and this is the opposite in many ways of what we're encouraged to do in our society today where we're told that if we don't feel well we should just go to a doctor and take a drug uh, or or buy something and that'll make us happy so the true happiness comes from blessing others and veganism which is really i think a a modern new english word for ahimsa or non-harmfulness uh, is pointing us in the right direction. And um uh, so I'd like to really talk now about the connection between what we're seeing happening in the world today right now and our routine mistreatment of animals for food. So as I talk about in the world peace diet and and Madeline my wife and I have been traveling for the last 30 years giving lectures on these ideas and and we see it really accelerating the process is accelerating in many ways the more we inflict violence and enslavement on non-human animals for food and clothing and entertainment and testing and vivisection and other you know uses the more we see that we ourselves are losing our freedom we're losing our health we're losing our purposes because we steal their health we steal their purposes and uh, we force them into imprisonment and as uh, we all know uh, their interests are to them as important to them as our interests are to us if we for s- some uh reason we're suddenly to find ourselves being viewed merely as tasty meat by a much more powerful species who could easily dominate us and enslave us and exploit us and use us for food uh, we would hope that this more powerful species would see that we are beings with awareness and that we uh, have a yearning uh to be able to fulfill our lives in our family relations however since we are the dominant species we very often fail to do that and i think the primary reason is that we're forced into this from childhood so it's not So, such a good idea i don't think to blame people or criticize them or shame them for eating meat and dairy products and eggs 
because the only reason anyone eats meat, dairy products, and eggs is because we're following orders. We're just doing what everybody told us to do. Our parents, usually our teachers, our very often even uh, the, the, the spiritual leaders, the, the, um, the doctors are all emphasizing we need to eat dairy products and very often even meat and eggs to be healthy, <clears throat> get enough protein to get enough calcium. So we wouldn't do it if we weren't pressured and, and compelled to do it from the time we're little infants. And the habits go very deeply into our identity. So this is a problem because uh, as we all know, animal agriculture is the biggest thing we're doing on this earth. There's no human activity that's more large scale than animal agriculture that has more of a negative impact on our ecosystems and on our society, on our physical health, on our psychological health and on our spiritual health than animal agriculture. And if we look at this from a holistic perspective, we see that the greatest gift we can give to ourselves and to our loved ones and to the world and to future generations, to animals, to, will, to wildlife, to ecosystems is to make an effort to understand the consequences of animal agriculture, all animal agriculture, especially dairy products, eggs, uh, aquaculture, fish, um, uh, animal, all forms of animal flesh, animal exploitation in general, because it takes enormous quantities of food, of grains, of corn and soy, alfalfa, wheat, barley, oats, to be fed to cows, pigs, chickens, turkeys, ducks, geese, fishes, and uh, so many different animals that are eaten or whose eggs are stolen or, or whose memory secretions are stolen from them. And this is very wasteful. And so we're understanding that this is the driving force behind the destruction of rainforests worldwide, which has become a tremendous problem. These are the lungs of the earth and we're losing now about three uh, acres per second of Amazonian rainforest and other rainforests due to animal agriculture and the demand for dairy products and meat and eggs. Uh, so this is unsustainable. And uh, as we cut down rainforests, we're destabilizing the climate. We're causing the largest mass extinction of species in 65 million years. We're destroying the intelligence really of the natural world by forcing hundreds of animals into extinction, animals and plants into extinction every single day. And we're also overfishing the oceans uh, to a point where oceanographers are telling us that by the year 2040, uh, the oceans will basically be dead. And 40% uh, of all the fish that we catch are not fed to people, but they're fed to animals. To, and, and cows actually are now eating lots of fish. Uh, even in India and, and uh, United States, other countries, Europe, uh, scientists have discovered uh, many decades ago that if you enrich the feed of dairy cows with fish meal, then they give more milk, it's profitable to do that. So uh, we have to remember that these fish that we're, that we're feeding to, to ourselves and the fish and to cows concentrate toxins in their flesh hundreds of times, thousands of times, even millions of times more in their flesh than in the water. That all of the toxins that we create on land end up in the oceans. All the heavy metals and PCBs, dioxin, nuclear, nuclear radiation, pesticide, herbicide, fungicide, residues, chemical fertilizer residues, pharmaceutical drug residues, all of this ends up in the flesh of fish. If we eat fish, we're eating that. If we eat dairy products, the cows eat fish and these toxins concentrate, it's well understood, in the mammary secretions of, of mammals. So, when, so in women, uh, the, their breast milk is very often toxic. Uh, scientists have done tests on human breast milk and found literally hundreds of toxic chemicals that are going right into the baby as soon as she, he or she is born. And the same thing is true if we're sucking at the breast of a cow, we're getting all of those toxins going right into us. Even if we're an adult, we're still sucking at the breast of a cow like we're a little baby, a little infant. And so uh, this is a behavior that no one does out of our own free choice. It's simply because 
we're following orders, we're conforming to society, we're doing what everybody else is doing. Sometimes that's a good idea. Sometimes it's a good idea to do what everybody else is doing. But if what everybody else is doing is harmful, is violent and abusive, uh, is damaging and destructive to the most precious things that we hold dear, uh, the health of our ecosystems, as human beings, we are responsible to our children and grandchildren to do the best we can to protect ecosystems. And animal agriculture is the most vicious attack against the web of life because it's wasteful. It takes, according to the National Academy of Sciences, which is a very conservative group, between 12 and 15 times as much land and water and petroleum and pollution to feed someone eating a standard Western diet as someone eating a vegan diet, a plant-based diet. So this is fantastic. It's not two to one or three to one, like twice as much land or twice as much pollution. It's 12 to 15 times as much. So this is fantastic news. This is great news. What, what that is saying is that we can dramatically, dramatically reduce the amount of destruction and disease and pollution on this earth when we human beings wake up and move toward a plant-based way of eating. That there's no greater gift than this, to understand these ideas and to live them, to bring our lives in alignment with them and to share these ideas with other people because we will not have a society uh, that's healthy or a world that's healthy if we fail to do this. The environmental destruction, the climate destabilization, the water pollution, the soil erosion, the water depletion, uh, all of these things, the creation of huge dead zones and the destruction of oceans, this, this is something that uh, is only going to be solved when we stop eating animal foods, which require us to waste and destroy land and water and petroleum and other resources. And, in the, and by the same uh, understanding of wastefulness, there's this wonderful good news that we can feed everyone on this earth. There's no reason to have hungry people. Hungry people are a direct result of injustice, of greed. As, as Mahatma Gandhi told us, there's always enough on this beautiful and abundant earth for everyone's need, but there's not enough for everyone's greed. And so again, if I'm eating meat or dairy products or eggs, I'm eating huge amounts of grain that could feed hungry people, but instead uh, we're feeding it to our animals and uh, eating their dairy products and eggs. And these animals uh, convert healthy grain into things that are unhealthy. Uh, we see that the highest rates of diabetes and osteoporosis, obesity, liver disease, kidney disease, breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer are in countries that eat a lot of meat and dairy products. Uh, dairy products are probably the most unhealthy food a human being can possibly eat because they're really not designed for us at all. Meat is also unhealthy in eggs, but dairy is especially unhealthy, not only because it's wasteful of resources, um, and, and causes uh, starvation and hunger, but because we don't have renin, which is the, the um, uh, digestive hormone that little calves have to break down the main protein in milk, which is called casein, which is a very large unwieldy molecule and very often causes autoimmune disease and type one diabetes and other diseases, uh, Crohn's disease, and as I said, breast cancer and other diseases. There are many, many carcinogenic uh, substances in milk, just that it, even if it's organic, uh, there are uh, IGF-1 gro growth hormone is the basic growth hormone that allows a little calf to put on a thousand pounds in just one and a half years of life. I mean, what are we doing eating something with IGF-1 growth hormone? It's the same growth hormone that we have as human beings to help us to grow. And it's forcing us uh, to grow in unnatural ways. Uh, it's causing cancer to grow inside our body. This is well understood that you know, we have in our body all the time little cancers that our immune system just takes care of. But if we have 
IGF-1 growth hormone from dairy products, which is in all dairy products, uh, going through our veins and, and arteries and into our cells. And that's like throwing gasoline on a fire and it makes it very difficult uh, for us to avoid the cancer epidemic. So by showing compassion to animals and to dairy cows, we're showing compassion to ourselves and to our own organs and cells. We're showing compassion to hungry people. Uh, the great um, Tibet, uh, excuse me, um, Vietnamese uh, meditation teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, said that if we eat meat and dairy products and eggs, we're eating the flesh of hungry children because we're eating the grain that could feed those, feed those children. So by moving to a totally plant-based way of eating, we're creating a wonderful foundation of health and harmony and happiness for ourselves and for everyone else, uh, for, <clears throat> for human beings, for indigenous people whose lives are being destroyed by the large ranching and animal agriculture farming operations that are keep cutting down forests all over the world and destroying habitat for animals and for indigenous cultures, causing starvation and hunger to people who have less uh, uh, economically powerful economies. But we, so if we, if we, as we, as we live in until it's too high, uh, for people who live in countries with less uh, industrialized and less powerful economies. And so uh, we, can, we can pay money to have meat and dairy products and eggs uh, while other people don't have enough money just to, just to eat grains because it's, we are causing a shortage of grains by, by bidding up the price on the world markets. So it's very important to make these connections. It's important to look deeply to, to analyze the situation, um, to open our hearts to kindness and compassion. I think also of the workers who have to uh, beat animals all day, electroshock them all day, cut them, impregnate them on rape racks, steal their babies from the mothers, kill the babies. Uh, you know, just the terrible violence that human beings inflict on animals for food on a routine basis. We're killing billions of animals every single day on this earth. This is a, not a small activity, it's, giant, it's vast. And there are our whole armies of our human brothers and sisters who are starving and going hungry or who are forced to do work that brings out the worst in them. These workers have the highest rates of injury and among the highest rates of suicide and drug addiction and alcoholism, <clears throat> child abuse and so forth. So. The whole idea is to realize that ahimsa, nonviolence, uh, is possible for all of us. Each one of us can be an example of this, as uh, we heard earlier um, from Pramodaji, and how we can each one of us be an example that inspires the people around us by how we view animals and insects and hungry people and workers and future generations and to do the best we can to minimize the amount of violence that we ourselves are causing. And when we do that, the wonderful thing is that we start eating organic, uh, plant-based foods. I think it's organic is very important because again, pesticide, herbicide, and fungicides and chemical fertilizers are killing birds and fishes and insects and butterflies and many forms of life and polluting uh, the water and and up our own body. And now well after that we have in our bodies a whole community of literally trillions of microorganisms, bacteria that are vital to our health. And if we're eating non-organic food that has residues of Roundup, glyphosate, and other toxic chemicals and herbicides, that this is an antibiotic that destroys the health of our microbiome community inside of us and we have all kinds of diseases we get very sick and we don't have energy and health and it's now well understood that the microbiome inside our body uh, is directly connected to the vagus nerve which goes straight to our brain and is responsible for many of the endocrine functions and for the general mood that we're experiencing so if we have a microbiome or a community of organisms 
that is not healthy because we're eating dairy products, because we're eating non-organic foods. We're not, we're not, not having internal energy that's, that's happy, that's getting the, the, the fiber that is so necessary, the plant-based starches that are so necessary, uh, that's getting uh, uh, toxins then that community is unhappy and frustrated. And that unhappiness and frustrated frustration actually is communicated right to our own um, emotional states. And so many people today wake up in the morning uh, feeling fr frustrated, uh, feeling unhappy. And of course, if we have an unhappy uh, community living inside of us, it's going to be happening in that way. The ancient teachings always emphasize of all the world religions, as we sow, so shall we reap. We will never be able to reap uh, uh, lemons if we plant uh, avocados. <laughs> so if we're planting seeds of violence and misery in uh, our relationships with other human beings, with animals, with, um, with nature, that we find it coming back and we find here we are, we've been doing this for 10,000 years. It was 10,000 years ago, we started for the first time to imprison animals. We started eating their flesh. Then we started stealing their milk. We started stealing their babies. Uh, we started dominating the female animals. We started creating a society where women are dominated and oppressed by men, where nature is dominated and exploited by human beings, where animals are exploited by human beings where we all contribute to that by taking out our wallets and paying for it, causing this kind of violence. And then we don't just cause the violence and walk away, we cause the violence and then we eat the violence and we feed it to our children. And so the violence becomes the very cells of our brains, of our hearts, of all of our organs. And we pass on this violence to our children, our innocent children. So this is again, not because uh, we're bad or evil, beings, it's because we're following orders. We're just doing what, what we've been told to do. And we see it's leading now to massive pandemics where everyone's forced to lock down their businesses, to lose their freedom of speech, lose their freedom of assembly and lose their freedom of bodily autonomy. We're forced to wear masks and hide our faces and muzzle our faces like we're animals and uh, become more and more like the livestock uh, that we are abusing. Uh, they're talking about f forcing all of us to uh, be microchipped and to be tracked and traced, just like livestock are. So uh, how can we expect ever to have a world of freedom for ourselves if we enslave others? This is the basic spiritual wisdom that people have been uh, expressing for thousands of years, sages and saints, and uh, uh, great founders of religions have always told us that if we want to have happiness and fulfillment for ourselves, the only way to do that is to give happiness and fulfillment to others, to be a force for love and kindness and compassion, caring and mercy and tenderness and gentleness in all of our relations. Because uh, as we heard earlier, even little ants yearn for their freedom and uh, how much more do cows and pigs and chickens and human beings, I mean, all of us. So we, each of us can make an effort to understand the ramifications of this and not be afraid of each other, to not be afraid to look behind the curtain, to see what actually happens to the cows uh, that we abuse uh, for milk, for example, to see that on any dairy operation, organic or not, uh, these, these cows uh, are killed at a young age. They, they don't, um, or, they're, or they, they just let go and, and to wander the streets uh, and live a terrible, uh, very, uh, a very um, <clears throat> a hard life full of suffering because um, they're worn out. You know, they, these animals very often are pregnant and lactating simultaneously. They're forced to, be, to have babies and then the, the babies are stolen, the milk is stolen, uh, they're impregnated again, over and over again. 
And so this <clears throat> domination of the sacred feminine dimension of life, which is really the, the core of spirituality in many ways, I think, is the feminine capacity to be receptive and to nurture life. The mother who gives birth to a baby and then loves and nurtures and protects that little baby is the foundation of a healthy society in, in, in our human world, and the foundation of, of a healthy child. And if we don't have that, we're not going to be healthy. And yet all of these other mothers and all of these babies, instead of allowing these mothers to nurse their babies and instead of honoring the bond, the sacred bond between the mother and her offspring, we come in with our knife and we stab the baby and we steal the milk and we sell the milk, we sell the flesh, we abuse and exploit the mother and the child. And how can we expect if we are not willing to look at this and, and to speak up for these animals, how can we expect that we're worthy of a culture of freedom and joy and abundance and happiness for ourselves when we steal freedom and joy and abundance and happiness from billions of other beings every day, completely unnecessarily? I've been a vegan for 40 years and there's millions like me who are thriving on a totally plant-based way of eating and living. You know, the word diet <clears throat> in the old Greek, the, the root of the word diet means way of life. So veganism is not just a diet, it's a way of life. It's a way of living so that everything I do is based in kindness and concern for others. The products that I'm buying to eat, the products that I'm buying to put on my skin, that they don't have animal products in there, the clothes that I wear, uh, that don't harm animals, don't harm human beings. We don't buy things, hopefully, from, from sweatshops, from human slavery, from animal slavery, to do the best we can to be kind and loving in our relationships with other human beings, and to take time every day to meditate in silence, and to take time every day to connect with nature in a way that's significant, so that we feel in our, every cell of our being that we're part of this beautiful earth, and that we're giving back in some way to help those who have less than we do. I think all of these things are, are possible for us as human beings. And uh, it's really precious, I think, to realize every morning when we wake up that we can give thanks for one more day. And we never know when this day will be the last day. Any day could be the last day. So to remember that our human birth is a precious opportunity, it's rare. We could easily have been born a cow or a pig or an ant or a chicken or a being in a hell realm or a being in another realm where there isn't really an opportunity for spiritual practice. But we're born as a human being. We have a body. We have a mind. Every moment is a precious opportunity to practice compassion, to practice inner silence, to question, what am I? Am I just this collection uh, of bodily matter and thoughts and memories? Or am I the infinite eternal consciousness that was never born and will never die? And that uh, like every other expression of life that we ever see, uh, that is one life living through all of us, can we awaken to the truth of the infinite eternal consciousness that is our true nature and allow that to shine through every thought, word, and deed as we go through our daily life, not just theoretically, but practically. So that's really the challenge. And it's, of course, it's not easy when we're in a society where we have economic pressure, we have to make money, we have to relate to people perhaps who are angry and frustrated, uh, who are afraid. So that's why it's so important, I think, to create communities of sanity. And I'm so grateful to Dr. To Rupa Shah and to, to all of you uh, who are part of this community. We have a, 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 an online community right now for a few minutes out of, uh, out, of our, out of our lifetime where we can just savor this moment, savor the feeling of being connected to each other, being connected to the love that shines in our hearts the love that shines in every cell of our being, 
savoring our connection with the wisdom teachings that go back hundreds and thousands of years to the great sages uh, of, of, of India who, whose lives uh, were a, a beacon of light uh, that is still shining through the darkness of thousands of years and lighting up our day right now with their wisdom, with their compassion, with their awareness, the great yogic traditions, the traditions of the sages. It's really essential for each one of us to bring these wisdom traditions on. If we don't, if we don't live them, they'll die. Uh, the uh, children of next generation will never know. So it's, it's, it's our responsibility, each one of us, to embody these ancient wisdom traditions in, in every moment of our lives, in all of our relations with, with others. And in that way, we can keep the ancient wisdom traditions alive. And then we can write and we can speak and we can create uh, videos and movies and music. But especially we can, in, in the sanctity of our own hearts, we can connect with the truth that there is one life living through all of us and send love, compassion, joy, and peace and liberation to all beings. Spirituality isn't anything uh, abstract. It's very concrete. <clears throat> and so I want to stop here and thank all of you for the wonderful efforts that you're making to help bring greater peace and harmony into our world. 